Now the Boeing 737 is one of the most popular aircraft in the sky and this aircraft behind me is the very first one, the prototype 737 and in this video I'm going to take you on a detailed tour of it. Boeing were falling behind the competition with multiple twin engine passenger jets such as the DC-9 and Sada Aviation 210 Caravelle taking the fight up to Boeing's thirstier three engine 737 and even the bigger 707. So Boeing fast tracked the 737 development, in fact to speed up the process as well as reduce cost, Boeing used much of the structure and systems from the 727 which itself shared a lot with the 707. In fact, the 737 was initially designed to have the two engines at the rear like the 727, although Joe Sutter moved them down to the wings, and his name will be quite familiar to Boeing fans. Obviously sharing so much with the older 727 and 707s also made maintenance easier for the airlines as well as pilot familiarity. The first flight was on April 9th, 1967, and while demand was slow to get going, over 11,000 had been produced and it remains in production today. One particular disadvantage of having the engines lowered to the ground instead of at the tail was the risk of ingesting gravel and other bits from rural runways. In fact, the 737 was sold with a gravel kit that had a gravel deflector on the nose gear to help reduce the risk of gravel being flung up and into the engines. We'll work our way back to the front and then continue walking around it. Again, here's footage of a 707 in Australia and the first 727 also in Seattle to compare the front end which was essentially identical. You'll notice that the top of the nose was painted in a matte black colour and this was commonplace with older aircraft and was to help avoid the reflection of the sun into the crew's eyes. As material and paints developed, they were able to manage this glare in other ways and paint the noses however the airlines wanted them. Above the main windscreen were eyebrow windows designed to improve visibility, although the reality was that unless they were doing things like in-air refueling, which most 737s weren't, it wasn't really that necessary and the crews would just block them to avoid the sun shining in. Eventually Boeing removed them as an option, hence why you don't see them on any modern 737s. Now this was the actual first 737 that flew in 1967 and after the development process was complete, it became a NASA Transport Systems Research Vehicle in 1974 and as you can see it still carries the NASA livery. It was used to develop electronic flight displays, GPS systems, airborne wind shear sensors and an external visibility system concept that was a windowless cockpit design for future supersonic aircraft. In fact, you can see some of the sensors for the wind shear system here. It flew up until 1997 when it was retired and is now loaned to the Museum of Flight here in Seattle. You can see the signatures of many people who worked on this aircraft as it was handed over to the museum. We'll zoom in here on the aircraft's name, Fat Albert. This rather unflattering name was because of its short and stubby appearance. Now remember that most other aircraft of a similar length weren't as wide until the Airbus A320 came along, therefore this was fatter, I guess. Looking at this old NASA photo, you can see that it really is a short, stubby looking thing. Now this duct here, which kind of looks like the side of a Ferrari F40, is a ram air intake that takes in cold atmospheric air that was used to cool down the pressurised air from the engines that was used to circulate in and pressurise the cabin. One disadvantage of putting the engines under the wing was that it would impair the airflow and thus reduce the wing's efficiency, therefore it needed lifted devices. Here you've got Kruger flaps which would deploy as you can see here, just via gravity because the hydraulic system is obviously inactive in this aircraft. In newer 737s these extended further to the wing root. The engines were Pratt & Whitney JT-8D turbofans with a low bypass ratio of 0.96 to 1, so almost the same volume of air bypassed the hot core as would go through it. This engine was used on the 727 and the US Navy A6 intruder aircraft. There was an upgraded after burning version that actually powers the Saab 37 Vigan fighter jet. The engine nacelles were attached directly to the underside of the wing rather than using pylons as you can see here on this 707 and this allowed the whole wing and fuselage to sit lower to the ground making it easy to load passengers and luggage at regional airports. This did become more problematic later as engines became much larger. Something else that was interesting was that they initially used the same reversed thrust system as the 727. This problem was fixed by simply changing the angle of the exhaust air, although it was actually lifting the aircraft upwards and reducing downforce on the main landing gear and decreasing the effectiveness of the brakes. 
and back onto the wings and outboard of the engine are the leading edge slats that are not deployed in this example. Their important role was to increase the wing surface area and lift, thus increasing the low speed stability which was important for small rural airports. You'll notice that this is not a fuel dump valve. In fact, the 737 can't actually dump fuel. Being a smaller aircraft means that it's never going to be carrying enough fuel to require a dump before landing, even if they land much earlier than planned. The trailing edge had triple slotted flaps in older models, but this was simplified to double slotted flaps in the next gen and max models, as this reduced complexity and cost. Making our way back to the tail, and a major advantage of fitting the engines to the wings, rather than back here, was that it simplified the whole rear end. It also allowed for the horizontal stabilizers to be attached to the aft fuselage, rather than at the top of the vertical stabilizer, as we would see in a T-tail, which would have required a considerable strengthening. If you've seen my 727 video, you'll know that the auxiliary power unit, or the APU, which was vital for aircraft such as this operating out of small airports with no ground power units, was located in the main landing gear wheel well. Again, because the engines in the 737 were under the wings, the tail area was free for the APU, thus removing the noise and hot exhaust gas from the hard working ground crew. Here's the APU inlet just underneath the aircraft's registration, and obviously the exhaust is aimed out the back. Now this panel here is just to access equipment and not an air stair as you may recall from the 727 video which DB Cooper made famous after hijacking the plane and then escaping out the door in flight with a parachute. But back to the 737. The original was the 100 series which was launched with Lufthansa but airlines wanted a longer version so the 200 series was released and was much more popular. In fact, only 30 of the 100s were made compared to over 1000 of the 200 series. Produced from 1984, the Classic series was introduced with upgraded engines with a much higher bypass CFM56 turbofans which dramatically improved the fuel economy and power, although it created an engineering dilemma, as the wings were already close to the ground so they actually shrunk the fan size and moved the engine forward of the wing so that it could sit higher and the fuselage was extended. The wing itself was also longer and later models got the flattened underside of the air intake. For a number of decades, the 737 was continuously upgraded until the Max series that we see in production and still under development with the longer Dash 10 model at the time I was creating this video. The next gen series was introduced in 1996 and a significant upgrade there was the introduction of a glass cockpit where most of the analog dials were replaced by large screens. Unfortunately, I couldn't get inside this aircraft, but here's a diagram which shows the standard cockpit and behind that was a test cockpit where they could develop new technology. The idea was that if the new one failed, they could fall back on the old analog one to land the aircraft. Here's a NASA photo from inside the test cockpit. Here's footage from inside another 737 elsewhere in the same museum. What's most obvious are the dials and not a single screen in sight. What's also important was that there's only two pilots and no flight engineer. The 727 required a three-person crew, therefore airlines, not having to pay for the flight engineer which reduced their running costs, grew in favour of the 737 especially once it got longer and carried more passengers. The 737 remains in production with over 11,000 built, and upgraded versions remain under development. Thanks for watching and if you're into these types of videos, check out my tour through the first 747 and 727 at the same museum and a whole range of other aircraft and rocket tour videos on my channel.